Returning now to the United States, as tensions with Iran take center stage, Customs and Border Protection have denied reports of Iranian Americans being detained and refused entry at the border between Canada and Washington state. Now, Sirus Habib is the lieutenant governor of that state. His parents immigrated to the United States from Iran before he was born, and he is the highest ranking Iranian American elected official in the US. He spoke to our Hari Srinivasan about these claims and his own personal experience of going blind at the age of just eight. So, Lieutenant Governor, what did your office hear about what happened with the tension at the US Canada border over the weekend? Yeah, I first started um, getting text messages and emails um, early Sunday morning from Iranian Americans. Uh, whom I actually know uh, personally, uh, saying either this is something that's happened to my family or this is something I've been hearing about. Could you look into it? Uh, and so at that point, we then, uh, I notified my staff. We contacted uh, our federal delegation uh, and reached out to Iranian American uh, interest groups, the, the uh, civil liberties groups and others. Um, and very quickly, we were all able to get on the same page and start collecting more information about what had been going on. So what were some of these people who you knew describing happened to them? What we heard is that uh, Iranian Americans, U.S. citizens who had been visiting Vancouver for the weekend, which is quite common among uh, Washingtonians to go across the border. Um, in this case, I think quite a, a good number of these Iranian Americans had gone to Vancouver for uh, a pop concert. Uh, that when they were on their way back to cross back into the United States, um, they were asked to um, leave their car. You know, when they're going through uh, driving uh, to, through the border, they were asked um, after after the kind of routine questioning, they were asked to leave their car. Um, park their car and then go into a processing center where they waited for several hours um, without being ever given any explanation as to why, uh, and then brought into an office um, and asked uh, questions by an officer. And the questions included things like, um, tell, you know, tell us about uh, any times that you have gone to Iran, when was the last time, um, who are your parents, uncles, siblings, cousins, um, do they have any tie to the Iranian military, Iranian government? Um, lots of questions about what do you do, uh, where do you live, uh, all of these kinds of things. And then after that questioning, they were asked to wait again for several hours while that information was shared with uh, some other uh, either center or it's not clear with whom. Um, and then in some cases, they were asked even some follow-up questions, and then finally they were let go. And so we heard about uh, folks, again, U.S. citizens being held at the border, not allowed to come back into their uh, home country uh, for anywhere from five to, in one case, we heard over 10, 12 hours. Besides the inconvenience, is there something that these border authorities are asking that is beyond the purview that they should not be asking when people are coming across the U.S. border? In my view, uh, there's no reason uh, to treat Iranian Americans any differently than any other American. And so, you know, my position is I can understand if it's the belief of Homeland Security that we are in a state of heightened security. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in my opinion, um, that is a direct consequence of the way in which the president has handled uh, our relationship with Iran. Uh, whether it's through withdrawing from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the so-called Iran deal, um, or the uh, escalation with respect to the drone attack that killed Soleimani. Um, perhaps, and I think it's, it's highly likely that that has placed um, Americans at greater risk. But if that's the case, then the security measures we need to be taking include um, asking everybody uh, extra questions. So if there's a security issue, then um, then, then all of us, when we come back into uh, the country, uh, need to be treated equally. That's no excuse for racial profiling. So it's very clear there's racial profiling going on when, A, the people who are being uh, held are Iranian Americans, and there's no reports of others. And plus, the Iranian Americans could very clearly hear others speaking Farsi. They could recognize that the others were Iranian American. And then, B, the questions that are being asked are very clearly tied to a concern about 
the, um, the tensions with Iran. So questions being asked like, you know, do you have family members in the Iranian Guard, um, et cetera. So, so all of those are completely inappropriate, in my view. The, uh, the U.S. passport, um, you know, is, is in, in my view, is a, like a key to your house. Um, and uh, so when you come home uh, at the end of your day, uh, the last thing that you deserve is for a stranger standing in front of your house saying, I know you got the keys to get in, but just we got to ask you a few questions about what you're doing in the neighborhood first. Look, I, I can hear in the echo, uh, in the back of my head, I can hear a supporter of the president saying, listen, so you're suggesting that these same questions be asked of every single person coming across the border at a time when we just took out a military leader of a specific country. We know that there are people who are Iranian-American coming back into the country. If there was a time for reprisal, this would be that moment. Should this not be the moment that CBP be more vigilant? Uh, so I'm not denying that this may be a time when CBP should be more vigilant, but uh, Iranian Americans are Americans. Um, you know, I, I was uh, the farthest east I was born uh, is Baltimore. So um, you know, we are Americans. Uh, we either were born in this country uh, or went through the extensive uh, process, vetting process, and. Uh, waiting times and, and all the different elements to, uh, you know, get a visa, get a green card, and then stay here long enough, take the test, and become naturalized U.S. citizens. So, you know, all of us are Americans. And uh, when we start going down the path of saying, well, who were your parents, who were your grandparents, uh, what's your last name, then uh, we are headed down the path that we here on the West Coast know all too well um, every time we learn about the history of Japanese American internment, uh, where there were U.S. citizens who just happened to be of Japanese descent uh, being uh, uh, interned in, uh, in, in essentially in concentration camps. And so while we're, we're, we're clearly not there yet, and I don't want to suggest uh, any kind of a comparison in degree, in my mind, uh, this is a very similar uh, tonal move on the part of uh, Homeland Security to start treating United States citizens uh, like we are different from uh, other Americans. You know, over the weekend, Homeland Security uh, put out a statement saying that their enhanced posture at its ports of entry is to safeguard our national security and protect the American people while simultaneously protecting the civil rights and liberties of everyone. Do you think they did that? You know, what we've seen is a lot of gaslighting from the Trump administration on this issue where, you know, they've been telling us, uh, we don't know what you're talking about, where there's been no directive to target Iranian Americans, and then they make these kinds of um, generic statements like what you're describing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I don't think there's any question. Look, if, if, um, if we had a, if there were a security incident in New York City and the New York Police Department were to say, uh, we're going to uh, just ask all African Americans, uh, to uh, not cross the Brooklyn Bridge until we can just ask them a few questions. We just want to ask a few questions, mm -hmm. and uh, in the end, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be fine. You'll go on your way. I think we would all know deep in our bones that that was racial profiling. I think we would all know that civil rights and civil liberties are being violated. And uh, so I think it's important here to recognize that uh, this is not an immigration issue. Look, it, as much as I disagreed, and Washington State was the first state to sue over the travel ban, and I disagreed with it and still do think it's unconstitutional and immoral, in that case, at least you're talking about uh, folks who are looking to come into the United States as immigrants or guests um, into the country. But th the distinction here is that when I come from Canada back in the United States or from England and fly back to the United States, I'm not immigrating. You know, I'm coming home. Uh, they also put out a statement to a lot of different media agencies saying social media posts that CBP is detaining Iranian Americans and refusing their entry into the U.S. because of their country of origin are false. Yeah, it's totally gaslighting people. I mean, the New York Times has reported over 100. We personally, uh, uh, I've spoken to uh, either family members, my staff has spoken to family members or individuals um, and uh, about 10 just in my office, about 60 uh, among us here in Washington State across the, the set of uh, leaders who have been uh, addressing this issue. Uh, so it's, it's, it's completely false. 
uh, it's, it's either intentionally dishonest or uh, using uh, the type of bureaucratic doublespeak that's meant to uh, at least confuse people. How much of this feels personal to you? I mean, it's very personal. Um, you know, I'll say, I mean, um, you know, we all uh, feel it uh, personally as Americans any time we see injustice in our country. Um, you know, I, I do believe that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And certainly we've seen um, people of color uh, being, uh, and, and immigrants, uh, and new Americans being disparaged, being mistreated, asylum seekers being held under ghastly circumstances at our southern border. All of those affect us as Americans. I will say in, in this instance, personally, uh, it feels uh, a kind of a particularly powerful and poignant because the experience of coming back across the border uh, is something that, that almost every Washingtonian knows. You know, we, we, we very much view British Columbia as a neighbor. Uh, but I will also say that for all of us, um, you know, since 9-11, Middle Eastern Americans, we always kind of have a sense when we fly, um, you know, back into the country or go through immigration and customs, we always have a little bit of a sense of, you know, well, we better be on our best behavior or look what might happen, uh, which is really unfair in the first place, that as U.S. citizens, we should feel that kind of, um, you know, sense of nervousness uh, when coming back to our own home country. So, of course, I, you know, because I share that identity, I not only feel uh, outrage on behalf of in my constituents, uh, but also uh, I can identify, I can, I can identify with these individuals in a very special way. So here you are, an American of Iranian descent. How do you use your position of influence to change this? Well, the first thing is that by speaking with you and and uh, other um, uh, media outlets, what what I'm doing. And what I think we, we need to do, who care about this, is to amplify these voices and tell their stories, um, first of all, to put the Trump administration on notice, to say to them, no, uh, actually, when you do this, when you do this to five people or 50 people, um, it, you know, or, or 500 people, we're going to know. Uh, we're going to call you out, and we're going to call you to account to explain to us, why are you racially profiling? Why are you violating? Uh, folks' constitutional rights as Americans to have equal protection under the law. So, uh, so that's the first thing, is that we need to be uh, uh, amplifying those, those stories, making sure that they are uh, heard, um, and, and that the, the government knows that they cannot get away with doing this. Uh, we are all going to be shining the light on what is going on at the border and what is going on at airports. And then the second reason, the second thing that we're doing is we are collecting these stories. Uh, we are documenting them thoroughly. We've got folks who have signed uh, legal declarations um, under threat of perjury. And so we are collecting those so that, uh, you know, we have the option to pursue uh, both either uh, at the governmental level through our through state government uh, or uh, the civil liberties organizations, the Iranian American Bar Association, the ACLU, and others uh, to seek legal redress. And then finally, I've been in very close contact with Senator Patty Murray um, and other members of our delegation uh, so that they can use their power in federal government, in Congress, uh, which they already have, to push leaders in homeland security to get better answers and get better clarity to make it clear this is unacceptable uh, for, for our whole country. But, you know, we feel it more powerfully here in Washington state because we're so proud of our border. We're so proud of the Peace Arch uh, and our connection to British Columbia. So that's what we're doing. But there's one other thing that, as an Iranian-American, I think it's important for me to do, which is on this larger issue of U.S. Uh, uh, Iranian tensions, uh, I think it's really important that uh, other Americans, my fellow Americans, know and understand. Iranian Americans are no friends of the Iranian regime, absolutely want to see reform and liberalization in Iran, but they know, we know, the way to do that is through engagement, and that when we escalate, all we do is strengthen the hand of the clerical regime in Iran. All we do is to cause Iranians, who may otherwise be reform-minded, um, to rally around the national flag of Iran, because there is tremendous, as you know, tremendous national pride, tremendous patriotism in Iran. So when there is a threat, 
uh, I think we take a big step backward on that front as well. And that leaves the entire region and the entire world in a more dangerous position. Uh, I want to invite our audience to understand you a little bit better. You're wearing sunglasses because you've been blind since the age of eight. But despite that, you've managed to go to That's right. you know, Columbia, Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, Yale Law School, and, and be the first Iranian-American elected to statewide office. I want to kind of understand, what's the driving force behind that? Uh, well, I appreciate you telling that to people so they're not just wondering, why is this guy wearing sunglasses, <laughs> especially in notoriously rainy Seattle? Um, yeah, I, I lost my eyesight as a child. Um, when I was uh, eight years old, I lost it to cancer. Um, that was in 1989, so I often joke that uh, all eight years I could see did take place in the 1980s. So all my visual memories are still from the 80s, so everyone still looks like Cyndi Lauper and Boy George. Um, we, you know, having had that, that happen to me, as you can imagine, uh, was not only uh, tough for me to adapt to, but for my parents who were Iranian, uh, Americans and uh, who live thousands of miles away from the country of their birth um, and uh, you know to have your child go through cancer and lose his eyesight uh, is so tough on a parent but what they knew um, which is really the truth about America is that at its best this is a country where no matter who you are, no matter what your abilities are, no matter where um, your, your, your ancestors came from, uh, this is a country where you ought to be able to work hard, uh, take risks, and get ahead and be given opportunity. And so they did everything they could to uh, teach me that lesson and to give me that boldness uh, to go ahead and uh, fulfill my own potential. And then as I got older, I realized that, you know, I had been so fortunate to have parents, including a mom who's now a judge, she was an attorney um, when I was a kid, um, who, who, who taught me my rights and who taught me about my right to be included, um, that, that I was so fortunate and most people aren't, and yet there are so many who are excluded um, for various reasons. And so I decided I wanted to become a lawyer and go into elected office so that I could be an advocate for them, because I knew, you know, I'm, I was fortunate enough to travel the road from Braille to Yale. Um, and that having a 24-hour-a-day pro bono attorney as a mom was a big part of that. Most people don't have that privilege, and so that's what I've sought to do for others who feel excluded and left out. Same way as, you know, when I was in third grade, I wasn't allowed to play on the playground, or later when I was told you can't take advanced placement classes in science because you're blind. Uh, the same way, these are Americans being, set, being told, you can't go home yet, you can't go home yet. Why? For no other reason other than this is your last name. And so anytime that happens, um, it, it, you know, it, it takes me back to those earliest experiences of being excluded and treated differently. All right. Cyrus Abib, Lieutenant Governor of the State of Washington, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.